so um, we're going to switch. Uh, we're going to switch courses here. So we're going to talk about upper urothelial tract carcinomas. And I, David assigned me this talk last year. I kind of went through it, but I do have a little personal history with this, only because one of my one of my good friends in the music industry uh, was diagnosed a few years ago and unfortunately passed. Um, Dan Petrolak actually helped me a little bit with his management, but it's, it's, it is an orphan disease, and it actually has designation as an orphan disease. So these are my disclosures. As many of you have heard me talk over the years, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a surgical historical buff. And so does anybody in the room recognize this gentleman? So this is the great uh, Alfred Blaylock. So Dr. Blaylock uh, basically uh, was a Hopkins grad, and uh, did some of the early work in uh, vascular hypotension and actually did the first surgery for tetralogy of Fallot. And uh, there's actually a great HBO movie on him. It's called Something the Lord Made. And uh, he basically developed this operation. So these ARS questions, only because I, David gives me enough crap, I like, uh, these are directed only at Dr. Crawford. So, David. Dr. Alfred Blaylock was initially accepted into the urology program by Hugh Hampton Young at Johns Hopkins. Is that true or false? Uh, that was the earlier. No, false. That's actually true. Because he, uh, he, was, he was thought to be an average student, and Dr. Halstead did not accept him into the surgery program uh, at Hopkins. So he, he entered into the urology program and within a couple years then, transferred to Vanderbilt to train under Barney Brooks at Vanderbilt, and his co-resident in medicine was Ashley Tinsley Harrison. And the pathology resident at the time at Vanderbilt was Goodpasture. So, Dr. Dr. Crawford, Dr. Alfred Blaylock died of metastatic urothelial carcinoma of a ureteral stump, true or false? Uh, I guess I have to say true. That is true. So he actually had, he was a chain smoker, as a student at Hopkins, he actually had a nephrectomy done for a tuberculous kidney. Uh, they left the ureteral stump, and lo and behold, he was giving a presidential address at the American College of Surgeons, drops over, and, he find, and they find out he has metastatic disease from his ureteral stump after a nephrectomy. So was, I'm, I sort of use that as a backdrop. So, we think of urothelial cancer, all of us who've trained historically in surgery, as this field change disease. So when you look at the data on urothelial cancers, we know there's about 80,000 new cases, and the majority of them we know are TCCs of the bladder. But upper tract, uh, upper tract cancers, and we're going to define that as renal pelvis and ureter, uh, they're, they're interesting tumors. They're, they, they exhibit more microsatellite instability and hypermethyl hypermethylation. And different from uh, urothelial cancer of the bladder, about more than 60% of upper tract tumors present with muscle invasive disease. So they're morphologically similar to their bladder, uh, their bladder colleague, but they're phenotypically and genotypically quite different. So I, uh, Gary Steinberg or, uh, left me this slide. So we know that this is your typical breakdown of urothelial carcinoma. And again, we know that the majority of them are muscle, or excuse me, uh, the majority of them are bladder. And when I was in training at Vanderbilt, we, you know, we always knew, we, and we were always taught us that rule of 80-20, right? But about 5% come from the linings of the kidney, 2% are in the ureter, and 1% is usually in the prostatic urethra. The epidemiology for upper tract tumors, the mean age is about 73. About 3% of the time, and it can involve both upper tracts. 17% of the time, it's concurrent with bladder cancer. And we know that the incidence of ascending tumors in patients with existing history of bladder cancer, it's about 2 to 4%. But if, it's, but if you have CIS in the bladder, it can be as high as 20 to 25% at 10 years. In terms of descending tumors, in other words, if you have an upper tract tumor as your primary, new bladder cancers, um, you know, basically can result in up to, uh, you know, up to 50%. So again, we know it's this field change disease, which has your typical TMN staging system. But again, different from bladder, six, greater than 60% of the time, it presents as a high-grade tumor. That's very different, that's very different from you know, our typical bladder cancer patients. 
you know, this is, all, this is an old slide when we used to do intravenous pilograms. These generally presented with a filling defect. Now, obviously, with extensive use of uh, CT, CT urograms with IV contrast, we don't see these films anymore. You know, really the problem that we run into is really a diagnostic problem. With the advent of fiber optics, we, you know, we can access the upper tracts very nicely now with flexible ureteroscopy. But again, because of the anatomy of the collecting system, all the little bends and curves that we have to basically navigate in order to get into the calyces and the minor calyces, as many of us have done a lot of flexible ureteroscopy, it's oftentimes easy to visualize, but once you start putting instrumentation, whether it be a, bi, you know, whether it be a, a brush, a laser probe, all of a sudden we have difficulty with basically the deflection. So diagnostically, from an imaging standpoint, from a visualization standpoint, we can find these, but however, sometimes the management of these can be quite difficult. Now, like everything else, um, you know, as, as we hear for every tumor type, we are getting to understand the, the genomic characterization of tumors. And I really didn't appreciate this till I started doing research on this talk, is that uh, this is a paper out of New York, and basically there is, there is an increased incidence of, of really increased mutational loads in patients with upper tract urothelial carcinomas and really highly, um, uh, it, it is the third most common tumor in people that have documented Lynch syndrome. So when you look at Lynch syndrome, which is a common inherited cancer syndrome, urothelial cancer is the third most common cancer. As many as up to 20% of people with Lynch syndrome uh, will have urothelial cancers. They tend to be women, younger age of onset, ureteral, not necessarily renal pelvis, and they have you know, bilateral disease. So again, whether we're talking about ureteral tumors, and clearly we're becoming more aware of this, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, this, this concept of germline mutations is something that all of us who are seeing these patients, we need to do a better job of taking family histories with regards to managing these patients. So again, this is, uh, I showed this, David knows this, so, you know, so between, even though they're urethelial cancers, sort of upper tract and lower tract disease, uh, being a music person living in Nashville, so this, if you remember this album, and actually uh, Dan Fogelborg actually died of castration-resistant prostate cancer. They seem to be twin sons of different mothers. Some people have actually speculated that some of this may be related to the embryology of the urinary, of the urinary tract. If you recall back in the day, we have, you have the pronephros, the mesonephros, the metanephros. You have induction as the ureteric bud comes up. And the question is, can that be, can that be a rationale, some sort of embryologic mechanism why these renal pelvic tumors actually have, uh, they act different from their bladder cancer colleague. Now, when you look at muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma of the bladder, and you've heard a lot of talks on this today from Dan and my friend Michael Cookson, is that basically for muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and we've, you know, you, we've had this discussion, is really, this should be considered for patients who are candidates for cystectomy, they should receive some neoadjuvant chemotherapy platinum-based. Uh, as we know, there's this movement of, and this is, a, this is just a partial list of all of our IOs that are out there, PD-1s, PD-L1s, I'm not going to go through all that. Now, when you look at upper tract GU tumors, if you look to the right here, you know, basically whether it's low grade or high grade, the treatment of choice is nephroureterectomy. So, you know, this is, this is really a disease that historically has been managed with surgery. And the treatment of choice is nephroureterectomy with a cuff of bladder. 
And again, for those of us that have taken care of a number of these patients, we know that if you do not take out the entire orifice and you leave a cuff of bladder, or if you leave any distal ureter, if the patients live long enough, the recurrence rate in that stump is somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. Now, with the advent of minimally invasive of, uh, therapeutics, whether it be hand assist, hand assist lap or clearly robotics, there's different ways that people are looking at to handle this cuff of bladder. But the surgical management has been primarily nephroureterectomy with a cuff of bladder. I don't think anybody would argue that for high grade disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But what about these low grade tumors? Could that actually be overkill? So again, this is the same recommendations for urethelial carcinoma of the ureter. Now again, for high-grade disease, just like neoadjuvant chemotherapy is sort of what we believe, what many believe is should be the standard for muscle invasive bladder cancer, there's more and more evidence being generated for the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in patients with upper tract urethelial carcinomas. This is a small study out of Japan, 55 patients, all had radical nephroes. 24 had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. These, as we talked about, are platinum-based. 31 did not receive neoadjuvant, and the overall, and the five-year overall survival was 44% versus 29%. Again, a very small study. Different study out of Japan, 230, they looked at 426 patients in different institutions across Japan. They found that 234 patients uh, had nephroes, 101, and these were all higher grade tumors. 101 patients had neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus 133 that did not. You had downstaging in the neoadjuvant chemotherapy group, 39% versus 14%. Lymphovascular invasion was 26% versus 46%. However, their five year uh, survival difference, there was, no, th there was no difference in five year survival. So again, I think people are looking at this, I know Dan has talked about this a lot, uh, relative to the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in these higher grade upper tract urethelial tumors. But what about, and somebody, meant, somebody in the audience mentioned this, what about lower grade upper tract tumors? Again, we talked about when you look at the guidelines, it says nephro-U. However, for these lower grades where we know sometimes access can be diffi uh, difficult, this could become a real problem because, again, we're looking at a tumor that's low grade, maybe has a high recurrence rate. However, if it's a, if it's a grade one, could this basically removing the entire unit on that side be overkill. And again, the rationale is that lower grade upper tract urethial carcinoma can be managed with endoscopic resection and ablation, but again, sometimes we have technical issues due to our instrumentation. High recurrence rates require repetitive intervention and intracavitary therapy. Nephroe is indicated when this is not feasible, but may be over treatment for many patients. So there is a company out there called Urogen. It's an, actually, it's an Israeli technology. Their US, is, uh, their US home is, is actually in New York. And basically, they have created a, a, a gel uh, called Mitogel. And, and what it is, it's an injectable uh, viscous solution that's injected through a ureteral catheter uh, under fluoroscopic guidance into the upper tracts. And then, it's injected as a gel, but then with temperature and with, with, um, with um, basically exposure to urine, this will actually solubilize uh, pretty rapidly within uh, the urinary tract. So it's injected as a gel, uh, as a polymer, but then with time, it basically results in this release of mitomycin. So this is their trial. This is the Olympus trial. Uh, it's a phase three open label single arm and, and again the population that they were looking at is not the higher grade tumors but in patients with low grade upper tract urethelial carcinomas of the renal pelvis. And again, they're using this, this, this gel technology that has 0.4% that has mitomycin in it. 
And so they, you actually have the, you, you, the screening is that you have to have an upper tract lesion and you have to have a visible lesion that they can actually monitor. I think it can be, it was like up to one centimeter. So they get a, a gel administration, again, injected through a ureteral catheter once a week for six weeks. They're then reevaluated and they're really looking for primary disease evaluation. Then if you've had a complete response of that, of that treatment lesion, you then go into this maintenance phase where you get, the, uh, where you get administration of the mitogel uh, essentially once a month up to 11 doses. So again, the, the key here is that this is, this is injected as a gel through a ureteral catheter, but again, this is for low-grade disease. This is not for high-grade disease. So this is the inclusion criteria. They have to be treatment naive or recurrent, low-grade, non-invasive, tumor located in the renal pelvis, the infundibuli, or the calyces, deemed appropriate for conservative renal sparing endoscopic management. Again, they have, to, they have to have a ureteroscopy performed within the last eight weeks, and you have to have one measurable tumor that they can monitor response. And again, we don't, they didn't want any CIS, no high-grade tumor, no BCG, no invasive urethelial carcinoma, and no systemic therapy. So as you might expect, they have a number of, a number of institutions involved in this trial, but these, these patients are really difficult to find. So they actually uh, are trying to enroll 74 patients. Can't remember, I think they're up to 50 something at this point or 60 something, and, and they actually have fast track designation to hopefully get approval um, uh, for uh, orphan disease status. So, again, this is the dosing four milligrams per ml of this gel. It fills up the entire renal pelvis. It's administered via a ureteral catheter under fluoroscopy. And again, the primary endpoint is the percentage of patients that had a complete response absence of that measurable lesion after that lead-in period of, six, of once a week for six weeks, pause for six weeks, and reevaluate. Additional endpoints were durability, percent of patients receiving follow-up maintenance therapy, uh, basically at visit four and then all the way out to about 12 months, partial response uh, at, their, at their first evaluation as well as safety and tolerability. This is what the demographics look like in this trial, 21 males. This was, this was the first 34 patients. Here was the mean age. Unreachable tumors at baseline in, 9 of, in, in 20, about 25% of patients and multiple tumors in over 50%. They had done some earlier, earlier, earlier studies and about in the, some of their initial work, they had about a complete response of about 20%. Then they, have a compa they had a compassionate use program where the complete response was about 44% of those patients, uh, four remain in complete, uh, in complete remission. And then obviously this was the first interim, interim analysis of this Olympus trial when they had 34 patients enrolled, 20 patients uh, achieved a CR, 13 have reached three months, uh, four reached six months. So we're going to start to see more and more data with this. I know Seth Lerner is very involved in this trial. Here are the adverse events, and the one that sticks out is this concept of ureteral stenosis of about 30% nausea, flank pain. Obviously, this can be, a, you know, the question is, is this related to drug effect, or could it just be related to putting up a ureteral catheter, causing a mucosal defect, a ureteroscopy, it's, it, it's sort of unknown. But the conclusions of this is that primary chemoablation of a low grade, again, I want to stress that, low grade upper tract urethelial carcinoma, it appears to be safe, it's feasible, it's associated with an acceptable adverse event profile. Preliminary efficacy data suggests primary chemoablation is possible. Durability of the CR requires longer follow up. And again, we're going to, you know, they're trying to get, uh, get to 74 patients. So, in conclusion, perfect timing. Uh, current standard of care for upper tract tumors is nephroureterectomy. Despite similar hist histology, upper tract tumors compared to urethelial carcinoma of the bladder present with much more aggressive high grade disease. Nephron sparing surgery for low grade upper tract tumors may be possible with potential approval of new agents to the market. 
neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to radical, prior to uh, nephroureterectomy may result in superior oncologic outcomes. And with that, questions? Yes, sir. 